Hello, everyone. Welcome to Innovative Universities webinar, where we discuss alternative university models that might as well turn out to be the future of higher education. I will uh, now say a couple of words about the webinar format so that everybody is prepared. First, it's 60 minutes sharp. We'll begin with a short presentation followed by discussion. Please post your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, second, the webinar uh, is a bi-weekly event, but if you happen to miss one of them, you can always watch a recording on YouTube. And thirdly, um, I'll talk a little bit about how we discuss cases um, and uh, well, how we select cases we discuss. Uh, first of all, we do our own search with ISAC. We are in constant collecting mode. And secondly, we do have uh, the steering committee, um, the names that you can see here on the slide who helped us identify good cases. Thirdly, we take suggestions from you. So if you know of a good uh, case of an innovative university, do drop us a note and we will um, have a look and add it to our roster. Uh, for the season. Now, let me introduce Issa Krumin, my co-host, um, whom I will now give the floor to. Thank you very much, Dara. Welcome to our new webinar. And we travel now to Europe, to the very center of Europe. I would say to the, uh, to one of the most beautiful places in Europe, which is value of Danube River, uh, to small, beautiful city, Krems, just one hour drive from Vienna. And uh, someone could ask, what can be unusual for higher education in this place? But there is. Uh, there is very interesting university which uh, is called University of Continuing Education Krebs. But it's not the institute that just provide, provides uh, short courses for, for the workforce. It's full-fledged university, uh, which, yeah, I, I'm not going to tell you the details because we have a rector with us. Uh, but, you know, we, uh, we had a discussion about inclusion of this university into our webinars list. And one of the members of our student committee mentioned that today, more and more universities are looking for expanding their target audience. We talk about lifelong learning, but still most of us in higher education system think that uh, our core business or maybe even our only business is to deal with people, let's say younger than 25. And uh, we have to, th to think seriously, what should be the model of university that goes beyond this age limit, goes to a different type of audience. And so we asked Friedrich Faulhammer, who uh, has been a rector of this interesting university for more than 10 years now to talk today about this model. And I'm very happy, in fact, Friedrich, you are the first uh, speaker at our webinar who, um, uh, who has an experience uh, to be high level government official in area of higher education. Uh, for quarter of century, uh, our speaker today was part of Austrian government agencies that were responsible for research and higher education. He was one of those who shaped European higher education policies. And uh, before appointing the rector of uh, our university that we are going to speak today about, uh, he was a secretary general of Austrian Ministry of Higher Education and Science, which is the highest civil service rank in the area of higher education. So Friedrich knows the landscape of Austrian higher education probably uh, as nobody knows. So 
we hope that today we'll have an opportunity also to chat about place of these unusual universities in uh, very traditional uh, higher education systems. Uh, Friedrich, the floor is yours, please. Yeah, so thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me and uh, introducing uh, me in this uh, in this webinar. And uh, as you uh, already mentioned, uh, the higher education landscape uh, of Austria, uh, I would start with that uh, to give you an overview. Uh, what are we uh, talking about uh, or what uh, are we uh, part of with our uh, University for Continuing Education? You can see here that in Austria, we have a, a quite a huge number of uh, higher education uh, institutions and uh, that we already also have a quite variety of uh, higher education institutions, uh, which we then can talk about maybe uh, later on. Uh, we are one of the public uh, universities. We have uh, 23 public universities uh, in Austria. We have uh, uh, from the number of institutions, uh, quite a similar size of universities of applied uh, sciences. And uh, we have uh, 19 private universities uh, in Austria. And, and quite interesting, there are uh, separate university colleges of teacher education. So uh, those colleges are not affiliated with universities. They are separate uh, institutions. Uh, and uh, so you can see the number of institutions is quite similar, but uh, uh, the, the biggest number of students uh, you will find at the public universities. So the public university sector in Austria is still the biggest sector in terms of money, in terms of students, uh, in terms of uh, staff. Uh, so we have in the University of Applied Sciences, private universities and university colleges of teacher education uh, are quite, uh, uh, quite uh, small institutions. Uh, uh, covering uh, those um, uh, students. So coming back to our university, the U University for Continuing Education, uh, as um, you already mentioned, uh, we are a very specific uh, university with a very uh, specific uh, target uh, group. Uh, we are the only uh, university, the only, at least the only public university uh, for a continuing education uh, in the German-speaking countries, you, you don't find any uh, similar institution. And we are one of the very few uh, public universities in Europe exclusively uh, targeted on uh, lifelong learning and uh, continuing uh, education. And uh, we have, of course, uh, almost 30 years of experience in, in teaching and uh, especially uh, research uh, as well. And uh, we are working towards uh, the societal challenges. So this is our very specific uh, mission. Uh, and um, uh, the, the reason for this very specific mission is uh, the reasons for the foundation of this institution. Uh, following very specific strength, we can show you uh, which uh, make us so, so different uh, to other universities. Uh, this is written down uh, in um, our strategic framework. Uh, many institutions, many universities have strategies. We do not have a strategy. We have a strategic framework. And uh, this sounds a little bit, well, it's similar strategy, strategic framework. We want to show that uh, in a higher education institution, uh, the, the idea of strategic framework is uh, more um, suitable uh, as we have uh, so many very, very um, high, with high uh, persons working with us with uh, high um, expertise, uh, which uh, do not need a, tight, a very tight uh, strategy. They need a framework uh, to, to find a common way of development uh, towards um, our uh, common goals. And uh, you will see the strategic goals. Uh, in the center, of course, we want to become the leading university for continuing education. Uh, and we have our key strategies, uh, of course, as basis for our activities to develop as higher education institution. But I do not want to go in depth uh, uh, with this. I, I more or less want to show you uh, what our, uh, are our specific uh, strengths uh, with our innovative approach uh, of uh, a lifelong learning uh, university. 
And this uh, strategic framework is, uh, if you if you like, uh, it's a, a kind of a condensation of our strategic activities. We have three key principles uh, which uh, we share with our colleagues in the university. Uh, one is uh, the societal impact I already mentioned. So we are want to work very, very closely uh, to the needs of society uh, with our students uh, and staff. Uh, uh, the second principle is uh, we want uh, to be uh, always innovative. Uh, this is one very uh, specific um, uh, uh, attitude. As our university was um, you know, the, the foundation of this university was an innovation as such. At the time when we have been founded, uh, we already had our own legal uh, person. And uh, at that time, all other universities in Austria were a part of the uh, state government, the state administration, state administration. So uh, beginning with our foundation, it was uh, a new idea of having a university. And of course, the the third key principle is quality. Uh, we want to have uh, the highest quality possible with our activities in, in research and uh, teaching. Uh, a few facts and figures of our university. We have around uh, 8,000 students uh, coming from uh, 99 countries, almost 100 countries. So we are very international. Uh, we have already more than 30,000 alumni of our university, university which are our most important ambassadors, uh, because all our alumni uh, tell their colleagues in the companies, in the society, that uh, they got their, uh, their knowledge uh, from our university. A uh, number of staff, around uh, 700. Uh, and uh, quite interesting, maybe, is we have uh, a budget around uh, 65 million euro, and uh, we have financial support from the government. But, of course, we have uh, a quite uh, huge uh, proportion of uh, third-party financing. And uh, maybe you are wondering, wow, a public university in Austria, uh, a so high uh, proportion of, um, of uh, third-party financing. The reason of that is that uh, uh, in Austria, uh, lifelong learning programs have to be uh, uh, financed by the students. So they are tuition fees for lifelong learning programs. Uh, and that's the reason as our all our programs are um, lifelong learning programs, uh, students have to pay uh, for this. And on the, on the right side of this, uh, uh, of this slide, you can see the development of uh, the third party research funding. Uh, we are not just doing lifelong learning, we are not just offering programs. Uh, but we also do research. As we are a university, we have, of course, uh, the task uh, not only to teach, but also uh, to do research uh, for a basis for the teaching uh, activities. Now, let me come uh, to our strength. Uh, I want to show you, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, our main uh, strength, which are, on the one hand, as already mentioned, we are the only public university for continuing education in the German-speaking uh, countries. And uh, as we are exclusively focused on lifelong learning, uh, we have around uh, the half of all students in Austria uh, in the field of lifelong learning uh, at our university. This is, of course, uh, not so um, surprising, uh, as this is our only task. All other higher education institutions uh, are, as Isaac mentioned, uh, see their main focus on the young students uh, and they have their lifelong learning uh, activities just as add-on uh, to their uh, main activities. Uh, our second strength is that we are, uh, we are focusing uh, in research intensively on the societal uh, challenges. Uh, so this is uh, the, the basis for our activities. Uh, which are assembled in three faculties uh, in five fields of uh, research, uh, five fields of research which are covered by all colleagues in the university and uh, 10 fields of study I will show you in a second. So here you can see uh, the fields uh, of the study programs uh, we are offering uh, from arts and culture uh, down to psychotherapy and uh, social uh, services. And uh, what I want to uh, mention is um, uh, our, our PhD uh, studies. 
as we are, as I mentioned, 30 years old, uh, we are offering a PhD uh, programs since 10 years. Uh, and uh, these PhD programs are organized uh, along the uh, so-called Salzburg principles. So, so our PhD students are not students. Our PhD students are early stage researchers. Uh, they do not have to pay any fees for these programs, but they are part of our research staff. They are employed at our university uh, with an amount of uh, 30 uh, hours a week, and they are exclusively working uh, on research projects uh, which are third party funded. Uh, so we really want to uh, implement uh, this uh, new idea of, um, uh, of having PhD uh, programs as first step into research uh, careers, uh, as it is written down in the so-called Salzburg principles. Well, our study uh, model uh, is, of course, as we are a lifelong learning uh, university, is our study model tailored uh, to the needs and the specific requirements of adult learners. Because our students have, you see, an average age of, at the moment, 39.3. Uh, so this is oscillating. Sometimes we have 40, sometimes. So this is uh, depending on the, on the students, uh, on the intake of uh, students. Those students are in very different stages of their life, uh, in different stages of their employment. And of course, they are living in their families at different places. So uh, they need a very specific uh, uh, treatment in the program. Uh, and therefore, we have uh, in all our, almost all of our programs part-time uh, uh, study uh, organization through innovative blended learning format. So we have always a combination uh, of digital parts uh, of the uh, running the program and on-site uh, on uh, uh, parts of the program. So we are combining in the best possible way the digital world and uh, the on-site activities. And we are doing this since 30 years. So it was the same in principle, the same before Corona. But after Corona, we learned, of course, and we have much more possibilities of uh, of uh, developing and arranging the digital parts uh, of our programs. And of course, uh, in some programs, we have uh, uh, now a new proportion. So there are more digital parts than on-site parts uh, of uh, the program. Uh, well, uh, this is again a strength uh, we can show as we have uh, only lifelong uh, learners uh, with us. So we have all the students uh, who have already uh, great experience and knowledge, uh, not only because of their first or second uh, um, academic degree they already earned, but uh, more on the basis of their uh, professional experiences they have. So uh, most of our students uh, have uh, 10 to 15 years professional experience uh, before they come to our university. And uh, the very specific um, uh, aspect is um, another very specific aspect is that our students, because of their uh, uh, knowledge and competences, they bring with them uh, our students not only learn uh, from our teachers and professors, but uh, they get a lot of impact from our uh, from their co-students. Uh, so they learn from each other uh, in the courses. Uh, not only from the lectures, and I can say you that uh, I can tell you that a lot of our lecturers learn from the students uh, at our university. So coming to research, uh, our research uh, orientation is uh, very much focused on uh, transdisciplinarity. We understand transdisciplinarity as a way of combining different disciplines uh, uh, and bringing into our research work society. Uh, and we can bring the great knowledge that our students uh, bring into our university. We um, use it uh, and participate from their knowledge within uh, our research uh, activities. And we do this transdisciplinary approach uh, in our five institution-wide uh, fields of research. Uh, here you can see these uh, five fields. We have digital transformation, health, and innovation. We have evidence-based evidence uh, health research, 
cultural heritage uh, is very much focused in our university, preventive and regenerative uh, medicine, and of course, continuing education research, as we are a university for continuing education, uh, we want to um, improve the whole system of lifelong learning at uh, universities as well. And I will come back to this in a few uh, seconds. And here you can see this idea of, uh, of university-wide uh, fields of research. All of our uh, departments, uh, all of our centers uh, within the university, they are uh, invited, I would say, invited to participate and to contribute uh, to our university-wide uh, field of research. Yeah, and uh, more or less uh, the, the last uh, uh, strength I want to show you uh, of our university is our location. As uh, Isaac already mentioned, it's a, a very nice place here uh, where we are located at the entrance of Wachau, which is a world UNESCO uh, heritage. We are very close to the city uh, of Vienna. We have um, um, uh, we are working on a very service-oriented uh, and inspiring work environment, not only for our employees, but also uh, for our uh, students. And we have the real uh, privilege uh, as university, and we are, I can say, maybe this is uh, innovative as well. Uh, we are the only public university in Austria, uh, which has um, the privileged situation that all the buildings, all the infrastructure we have here at our campus, uh, we can use uh, without any uh, charge. So uh, the region of Lower Austria is offering this uh, to us as university, and I'm a really happy rector because I, I don't have to think about uh, uh, the prices of uh, electricity and, and, and any other things because I just have it uh, because uh, of... Um, uh, the, the funding by the regional government. And at the end of my presentation, I would uh, mention two uh, strategic developments uh, we started uh, in the past. Uh, one is uh, we, as I mentioned, we not, not only want to do um, um, university continue education, just uh, research on it and offering programs, uh, but we also want to develop the system. And uh, we started uh, to create um, a European University for Cat Academic Continuing Education. We gathered uh, together um, 11 universities from all parts of Europe uh, to work together to, um, to implement and to motivate, uh, to convince more universities uh, in Europe and maybe beyond, uh, to invest more into lifelong learning uh, activities and to see it as a, a great, uh, not only chance for the future, but also responsibility uh, towards society to do more in the field of uh, lifelong learning. And we want to create a model uh, for all other uh, higher education institutions in Europe uh, to uh, implement this. This is uh, one aspect. The second aspect is uh, that we are uh, we are. We started, uh, by the way, in the year 2020, an international think tank uh, with uh, with focus on the future of continuing education at universities. This is uh, called Crossroads in Academic Continuing Education case. Uh, the next case assembly online uh, will take place on the 27th of uh, November, uh, where we want to bring together not only European, but uh, also from Asia, from, uh, from the US, from Canada, people working on the future ideas of a continuing education of, uh, at universities. And the third development, a very uh, recent development, uh, is um, the foundation of a new format uh, named uh, University Dialogue, uh, CREMS, uh, <clears throat> which is a strategic forum uh, where we bring together uh, leaders and researchers uh, in the field of uh, uh, especially university governance to think about uh, what is needed for the future uh, of universities uh, and their governance. And why we are doing this? Of course, uh, not only we, of course, we are convinced uh, and we see the objective of the European Union as well. Uh, and uh, there was a meeting uh, of the uh, ministers uh, of uh, Social, uh, not the ministers, but uh, the responsible uh, ministers of social affairs uh, from the European Union. And they said it is 
of course, important to improve higher education, to improve continuing education at universities. And they have a target by 2030, at least 60% of adults should attend continuing education programs each year, 60%. We are far away from this, and we never will reach uh, this if the universities, all the higher education institutions in Europe would not contribute to those uh, developments. Uh, and so uh, we, of course, as University for Continuing Education Krems, uh, want to continue to lead the field uh, in academic continuing education and to improve it uh, for Europe and hopefully beyond. So thank you very much. Thank you, Frederick. Um, Isaac, would you mind if I begin? Uh, yes, please. Uh, Frederick, so um, Isak and I are actually of the old Humboldtian guard, and we do not truly believe in universities without research in the sense of active process of discovery. But uh, that belief is so intrinsic by this point and so implicit that it's difficult to reconstruct. So I think it will be good to ask you, why do you need research? You're doing continuing education so well. You could be excellent in that, borrowing research from other institutions feeding on uh, the achievements of others. Why bother? Yes, Dara, 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 sorry, I, I, I want to add, in fact, this is the question for, for the presentation, because I just, before the webinar, I looked at, uh, I asked uh, artificial intelligence to tell me about best universities in continuing education. And by the way, the good news is that Krems is, uh, among 10, but it's, but all other universities uh, like Harvard or MIT, uh, et cetera, also in this list, they call their continuing education extent, something like extension. So they don't consider them as mainstream of the university. So that's uh, exactly what Dara is asking about. Yeah. So th thank you for that question, because, uh, of course, that's at the, the core of uh, uh, of being a, an innovative university. Uh, so as you mentioned, all in all our systems, uh, we see that uh, it is just extension. And it is uh, the case. It was the case in Austria as well, uh, when the all other universities have to have uh, some lifelong learning programs. Uh, they name it not extension, but uh, it is in a, in a certain way like extension at all other universities. Uh, and so this was, uh, uh, I would say, the reason why the, why the Austrian government uh, 30 years ago and the parliament decided to found a university exclusively working on uh, lifelong learning uh, activities. And when you now ask me, why do you need research? That's, uh, I would say, in a certain way, a funny question because uh, uh, when when we had a um, uh, we had a um, PhD accreditation procedure and there were peers and uh, we wanted to start with the PhD uh, of uh, regenerative medicine and of course we had to prove that we are do um, is um, uh, relevant and 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 uh, best quality research in the field of regenerative medicine because otherwise. Why should you start with a PhD program uh, if you don't have research? And uh, so, and one of the peers asked me, you are a university for continuing education. Why do you need uh, research? And I answered him, yes, because we are a university for continuing education. So <laughs> uh, if you think that uh, continuing education, you can do it without research, uh, you can just organize programs with anybody, uh, bringing them together from anywhere, borrow research from others. Of course, then there is no university. Uh, you can do it in a hotel and you uh, can have just organizing the programs. So this is a different, uh, a different, uh, let's say, a different um, idea of organizing continuing education. Um, so the idea we are have here is, as the Humboldt University, doing research and on the basis of research doing uh, teaching and so um in one in, in one aspect we are not very innovative because uh we are doing research and on the basis of research we are doing teaching so this is not very very innovative the innovative thing is that we have a specific target group uh 
uh, the, the professionals, the older ones, the adults, the lifelong learners. Uh, and we have to take into account that they have already knowledge. So it's a specific, the specific idea of organizing the programs. But the basis, the basis of having the programs is the same uh, as it is in the classical Humboldt uh, Humboldt system. But uh, still, to uh, I will try to uh, kind of to open this further because again, uh, I guess nineteen nine. I wanted to say 95, but probably 99% of continuing education programs are focused on professional skills, improving professional skills. So uh, it looks like you make a statement that for today economy, for Europe, for, for Europe in particular, maybe uh, these professional skills should be upgraded not just as vocational skills but also on the basis of research yes Am I? That's, yeah that, that, that's the idea that's the idea and uh I, I think it's not uh when you when you uh when you um when you're looking to other universities doing it as extension at the end they're doing it on the basis of research because they are research-oriented institutions, uh, and they decide to. In the main, the main course is having the young students on the basis of research, mm -hmm. uh, and then they have the extension, and they say, "Well, that's not so important. We do extension." So the difference is, we think that extension is very important. So we are a kind of a university for extension uh, in that in that sense. But still, let's go to the core of this. So I'll continue Isaac's line of questioning. So the main umbrage uh, um, university transformers usually take with the Humboldtian university model is that it has never been proven that a good researcher it can also be a good teacher. There is no connection. Some of them are, some of them are not. So uh, if the main task is to provide excellent education and we are not even talking now about continuing education, just excellent education in the widest sense, then you don't actually need research, or do you? What's your position? What is research truly adding? Active research happening alongside the educational process, what value is it adding to the outcomes, to learning outcomes? Uh, well, I think uh, this is, you know, especially in the maybe in the European case, uh, a, a hot topic discussion uh, about uh, do we need research for good teaching uh, or mm -hmm. for excellent teaching? Uh, and this is, let's say, um, a, a system decision uh, so far, a system decision to say that uh, higher education uh, should have not only the basis in uh, of, uh, of the knowledge of the research results in the books, and having very separate people than teaching this. Uh, so, but the, it's, kind of, it's, it's still the Humboldt uh, idea, having uh, the researcher in principle, having the researcher as uh, the person who is telling about his uh, or her research uh, results. But we all know that it is, this is not the case for 100%. This is an attitude, this is a principle, because you will find uh, at any university courses, uh, there are young uh, pre-docs, pre -docs, they have so far no research results and they are teaching about uh, this or that. Uh, but then you will have uh, parts of the programs where we have strong researchers uh, telling about uh, her uh, or he, uh, his or her results. So this is a principle, an attitude. Uh, and at the end, I can, as lawyer, I can say it's written in the law. So uh, it's uh, uh, no 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 chance to do it or not because uh, this is the the uh, the principle which is written in the Austrian law. But and uh, so it will remain. I just yeah. want to uh, yeah, yeah. support that. But, yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, uh, I'm going to come to the law, but still, um, uh, I have uh, uh, again. We observe now decline in an in enrollment of the traditional students uh, almost in all western countries or countries with western uh, type systems like south korea and 
there are a lot of, uh, in fact, in the morning I talked to the colleague from Australia. They have significant decline in enrollment. And I asked him, why don't you open uh, universities for continuing education? And he said, no, we are research universities. Uh, but uh, so we have this attitude. Um, can, uh, and one of the reasons is that students in uh, mainstream programs are kind of uh, better for researchers, for, for research-oriented faculty. Uh, they, some of them can also become a researcher. So uh, could, we con could we look from a different angle? What uh, experience of teaching in continuing education programs could, br could bring to researchers, to knowledge acquisition? I, again, uh, Dara and I consider research not in very narrow sense, uh, the, uh, something that uh, the, uh, has research articles as out. Mm -hmm. We are talking about knowledge generation, right? So why uh, could it be that in the future, students of continuing education could be uh, uh, helpful for uh, those faculty who are in the business of knowledge generation? What do you think? Well, uh, you, this is one uh, important aspect, uh, which, of course, uh, is um, challenging for our researchers uh, because uh, they don't have this a very natural uh, way of finding young researchers uh, coming out from their young students. That's that's a, a really, uh, let's say, challenge for our researchers because we have to, to search for our young researchers from other institutions. Because mm -hmm. our professionals we have in the in the in the programs, uh, uh, they are not mainly interested uh, now to become a researcher. They are interested mm -hmm. in uh, in to get the best possible new knowledge mm -hmm. from our mm -hmm. uh, from our uh, mm -hmm. within our programs. And, mm -hmm. and by the way, when we are talking about uh, uh, how why do we need research uh, within our institution? Uh, I would say it's a, a matter of uh, quality of content as well. Uh, so we want to show our students that we stand for high quality of what we are teaching, and uh, and therefore uh, it's uh, good to have the basis within our own uh, institution. Uh, but that's uh, that there we are true. That's uh, quite uh, challenging for our research uh, staff. And sometimes some people in our university are wondering if it could uh, be a way for our university to become a, let's say, normal, normal university, uh, offering all the widest range of programs, uh, which are am not in favor at all, uh, because then uh, we are throwing away our USP we have, because we are the only university for continuing education. Uh, and so we have to tackle this. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, we should stay with this uh, very uh, specific, uh, very specific target. Uh, but that's uh, that's a challenge. Yes, you are true. But uh, can we consider, uh, uh, in fact, I, I'm, I'm quite familiar with one of your programs uh, on higher education studies. I have to say that uh, your university is the only university in Austria that has a uh, uh, department of higher education research. It's it's very interesting. And uh, I, I spoke with with the professors and uh, uh, head of the department, Professor Attila Powis, it's mentioned that the experience that students, part-time students, bring to their uh, classes is super valuable. So he said that uh, it's not just one way road I'm teaching them, it, I'm also learning from them. Yeah. Is it is it a kind of normal pattern for your university. Yeah. That's what I mentioned before within this one of our strengths, that we have this exchange of knowledge, uh, not only uh, from uh, the teacher to the to the students, but also uh, in between uh, the students. This is a principle 
uh, and it is in principle the, ca the, the, the case in all of our programs. Therefore, it's very important for the co-students that they have interesting co-students. So they are not only coming to our, our university uh, because of uh, the high quality research in the different field, mm -hmm. but also to meet mm -hmm. uh, with other students uh, coming mm -hmm. from uh, maybe similar mm -hmm. or different areas with, uh, with uh, similar um, uh, knowledge. Uh, Maybe I, I would um, add one uh, exception within our programs, uh, the so-called Erasmus Mundus uh, master programs. Uh, those programs are financed by the European Commission. And uh, in those programs, we have uh, quite young uh, students uh, because those are bachelor graduates uh, who are searching for a master program, uh, uh, for a financed master program. And uh, so this is the exception where we have quite young students. And in that field, and we have it, for instance, uh, in the field of, uh, of um, uh, the so-called Maria program, uh, in the field of research and higher education innovation, there we have uh, young students uh, within the master programs. We then uh, have the possibility to maybe go into research or go into, into um the governance of the higher education systems in their countries, which is a very international program. Um, so I want to take this a bit out of the um, Humboldtian and research waters and closer <laughs> to the educational model. Um, so I have a question for our listeners who are unfamiliar with the Austrian system. So your programs have this interesting extension, CE, bachelor's in something, and then CE in the parentheses, which stands for continuing education. Uh, so just a clarification, how is that uh, faring in the labor market? Um, is the diploma um, within continuing education, uh, specified as continuing education diploma, considered as weaker, stronger, no one pays attention to the extension? What is the situation? Yeah, well, thank you for that question, because this is pretty new, uh, this CE behind uh, the degree. Uh, it was a decision by the parliament uh, to, to, to have a distinction between uh, the, the degrees for, for the normal students, uh, for the young students, uh, and for those who are uh, coming out from the continuing education program. So, um, and it was, it was a kind of, uh, you know, the discussion was to, to create uh, just new degrees for uh, continued education students, uh, which we were not in favor at all. Uh, and therefore, the result was this kind of CE. Uh, and uh, when you are asking me, how is it uh, seen uh, weaker, stronger, I would see it, uh, it's different. So it's not a, a question of uh, weaker or stronger. It's uh, showing that those students are, ca are coming out of a program where they have already, they have already uh, experience and, and knowledge when they get in. Uh, and uh, so they are different developed uh, within our um, uh, academic um, activities, within our programs. And at the end, uh, it is in, 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 in terms of value, it's the same, but it's still different. So the labor market knows that it is different if you have a student coming out from a normal program, never have seen a company from inside, or if you have a lifelong learning student uh, who have a different kind of studying. He, he showed that he can reach the results of, uh, of a program uh, with, uh, uh, in a, a different time period, within a different uh, setting. Uh, and uh, so this is the, the, the labor market uh, can make uh, its choice. Which person is more fitting into what the labor market is uh, searching for? Uh, so I would say it's just a matter, it's different. It's not stronger or weaker. Mm. Um, I have also a couple of clarifying questions about how SACT programs work. Uh, so for our listeners, um, this is information from uh, your website and your materials. A SACT program would be a program that is, please correct me, Friedrich, um, that results with a degree, but... Um, is constructed as a combination of shorter courses. So uh, how does that work in terms of um, holistic experience of a bachelor's that universities that specialize in non-continuing education deem uh, to be one of their main advantages? 
Like, is there still a system to the bachelor degree or master's degree? Yes, it is, of course, because at the end, uh, the result have uh, result has to be the same uh, if you make a bachelor's uh, within uh, the classical system or within the con continued education uh, system. But it is, of course, a very uh, different approach. Uh, and it is a strong debate uh, uh, between the, the classical universities, uh, which are thinking that it's impossible uh, to get a bachelor level uh, without this holistic uh, uh, experience being for um, uh, un, um, uh, undisconnected uh, experience at university and, and not just putting together parts of it. Uh, and uh, so uh, it was um, uh, our decision because of uh, the expectation and the needs of uh, the people and the possible students. So you can, of course, you can as institution say, well, it's not my problem that uh, we are not uh, fitting to the needs of the potential students. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, we want to work for the societal impact and for development of society. And if there is a need for a different way uh, of getting to the same uh, to the same end of bachelor's and master's level, uh, we wanted to create a way uh, of uh, of flexible uh, learning paths for uh, students who are in different situations as young students are without family and without uh, professional responsibilities. And this is the so-called stackability where we try uh, to, uh, to offer a very flexible ways for students that they can take part into courses when they have the time and they can uh, take the time they have uh, and they come back later on uh, to uh, to, uh, let's say, collect piece by piece of a program at the end, uh, and then to have this um, uh, this um, uh, result. And <clears throat> maybe you can say, or I can say this is not very innovative, because if you look around uh, into, into the world of uh, lifelong learning, continued education, this kind of stackability is discussed uh, uh, within, uh, I think, all parts of, of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, to make it, especially in the field of lifelong learning, uh, more flexible. Uh, the, maybe the difference is that, that in many other systems, uh, this is not degree awarding. Uh, and maybe this is the very specific situation that we stand for the possibility. It has to be the possibility to use this way of stackability uh, um, and also have the possibility to get an uh, academic uh, degree. So again, it's different. It's The result is uh, on, on the field of qualification level. Of course, it, it has to be the same of the qualifications framework you have in Europe. Uh, we will have all the outcomes uh, which are needed, but the way to that is different because the, the students are different. They start from different level than uh, students who maybe more need this holistic approach in the classical uh, Humboldt world. But still, uh, Dara, if you allow me, uh, first, I think, uh, Friedrich, uh, would you agree that uh, this um, micro-credentials takeability approach, indeed, it's becoming common for um, continuing education programs, but uh, mainstream university, traditional universities, uh, and accreditation agencies uh, are not really embracing this. It's and uh, I know some questions in German uh, higher education system that uh, even in online programs you have to start and finish in four years. Yeah, uh, and there is no real flexibility. So I guess it's also very important. But coming. Uh, Coming back to Dara's question about the experience, still, uh, so is your degree just a, a collection of small degrees or you provide some additional student support, uh, maybe a, a, a counseling services for those, a ass, uh, yeah, assistance for yes. those who want not just collection of micro yeah. uh, credentials, but to build the degree. Uh, uh, well, we have on the one hand, of course, uh, on one hand, we have the program. So uh, 
each student or each uh, mm -hmm. potential student uh, has a possibility to do it mm -hmm. in a classical way as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Those uh, the, the idea is to to offer our, our potential students the flexible ways uh, they they need uh, and. Uh, of course, when before we started uh, with that print with that system uh, or planning the system, drafting the system, we did uh, a survey uh, asking what are your needs, what do you uh, expect coming to a university for continuing education, and uh, there was the feedback. This kind of flexibility is really needed. Uh, well, and as we have this uh, specific um, a tasks, uh, a task to. Um, have as university for continuing education to offer ways um, uh, along the needs of the potential students, uh, we picked it up. And this kind of, uh, of uh, on the one hand, we are drafting the programs. Of course, we are drafting the programs with the outcomes. Uh, and the students have the possibility to do it, to do it like, like it is written down. But they have, of course, guided by our teams at the departments and centers the possibility to do it in this flexible way. So they are not alone in collecting all the pieces, uh, but they are guided uh, and counseled to find the best possible way. Um, I will uh, ask a follow-up there. So I was wondering about a system as in, so you have separate pieces of credentials. We can call them micro-credentials. We can call them micro-degrees, whatever. Um, the, the audience prefers. And each of those pieces has a system within it, a pedagogical system, uh, which includes content, which includes specific methods of teaching, yada, yada, even a selection of professors. But is there an overarching system? Yes. Yeah. We have an overarching system, which is called uh, standards and structural elements. So mm -hmm. this is a, a system which is covering all programs. They are the principles for, for all the, the lectures, uh, for all the, the content of the, the curricula, uh, which is covering all uh, teaching activities. Uh, so there is, let's say, there is, of course, the freedom of teaching as it is written in the Constitution, uh, but uh, there is not a freedom in, uh, in, in, in organizing uh, and in drafting uh, the the, the framework of, of the teaching. And this is a, a, a scheme which is uh, based on a decision of the Senate. In, in Austria, the Senate is re responsible for uh, the curricula uh, and the rectorate. So this is a common effort to, to, uh, to build the basis uh, of the standards and the structural elements. So this is not just um, uh, floating away uh, and around. So maybe I can answer the question. With that, uh, we can just hear a policymaker speaking through a university leader now. It's it's marvelous, truly. Um, so, yes, Isaac. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. Let's move a bit from pedagogy to the business, um, because in many places, in in many countries, continuing education is considered as a cash cow for universities, and um, it's nothing wrong with that. Uh, in fact, I'm really surprised with the figures of third party funding uh, at your university, 44% for public university, it's quite something. So it means that you have to be entrepreneurial, you are working on the open market, you work with competitors. So uh, what, uh, how you... So you mentioned that your unique selling proposition is that uh, you you do continuing education at a research university, but uh, how do you see this market? Maybe trends, um, what uh, these type of students prefer? Uh, what uh, who are your main competitors? With particular, maybe you would like to mention something about online universities that are trying to uh, uh, overtake the uh, continuing education market? Mm. Uh, first of all, uh, this 44% uh, is the public funding. So it's very important. We do not have to have continuing education as cash cow. It is mm -hmm. no cash cow. 
uh, and it it's we have no need to have this cash cow because we are a public university with specific public funding and mm -hmm. uh, right now we have 44 percent and uh, the goal is and this is together uh, region and uh, and the uh, federal state so our goal is for the upcoming years that we will have 50 percent of our funding should be public funding mm -hmm. and therefore we are not so uh, extremely uh, searching and needing uh, uh, ex extremely strong uh, market position. So what for us is important is quality. We want to to have the best quality in continuing education, in higher education. Um, and uh, that's uh, in, in, in more important. Well, the online, um, the online competitors, yes, of course, uh, for students who do not want to travel and who do not want to meet in person, uh, they have uh, more possibilities in, in online uh, programs. Uh, what we can offer is a combination. And uh, as we have, uh, and, and we are convinced that you need for a high to, to, to reach, and now we, do, uh, again, we are again at pedagogy, uh, to, to reach this kind of experience of uh, how to work together to create uh, higher and to, re to create research knowledge, research-based knowledge, you need a kind of personal interaction. And we want to stick with that. Uh, and uh, if we lose uh, students because of that, okay, that's it. Uh, we, we let uh, them go because we are convinced that we need this combination. And uh, if you ask me who are in our region here or in Austria, at least uh, the main competitors, uh, well, this is uh, the place, especially in Vienna. We have two universities doing uh, lifelong learning as well, very, very professional, which is uh, the uh, VU, uh, University for Business, um, uh, and uh, the University of Vienna, of course, as the biggest uh, university uh, in Austria. Uh, and then there is on the horizon um, maybe a new competitor, because uh, as in Germany, there is not very much activity on lifelong learning at uh, high, at public universities, at least. Uh, we have a lot of students coming from Germany uh, studying at our university. Uh, but step by step uh, in the laws of the German lender, uh, for instance, Baden-Württemberg, now there is um, a kind of an amendment and the universities get the responsibility to do more in the field of lifelong learning as well. They are not happy with that. Uh, but <laughs> Uh, looking maybe into 20 or 30 years future, uh, when they really start with lifelong learning, that could be a problem uh, for us, uh, because uh, then we have much more competitors uh, in the in the German from the German market. Uh, but for the moment, uh, uh, I, I would see that uh, this is uh, not very likely that there very fast uh, uh, will be a change uh, in the whole uh, German market. So it is interesting that even though you talk about competitors, you still are directly contributing to creating more competitors via your innovation pipeline and innovation yeah. spread. So I yeah, have... That, yeah. that, that's the reason, that's the reason uh, but why we are public university. So this is our responsibility. We have been founded to develop, improve the system of, uh, of lifelong learning at universities. And uh, that's the reason why we have public funding. So uh, we would be happy uh, to contribute uh, to the improvement uh, of this field of uh, continuing education at universities. Uh, that, those, uh, that really sends to my heart <laughs> and I'm sure Essex as well. We have one final question for you, uh, our usual question for our guests. So if someone were to be offered to lead an innovative initiative in higher education, regardless of the institutional or state or even regional level, what would you advise them? Well, in the from from the perspective of my experience is uh, I would um, say he or she should try to find supporters from the first possible stage, uh, then I would say it's easier uh, to convince uh, and to convince the decision makers uh, to open up uh, possible new ways. 
Thank you. Frederick, it's been a joy uh, and a pleasure for us. So, dear all, we are finalizing our third webinar of the second season. Isa, can you please present our next speaker? Yeah, in two weeks. Uh, but first, let me thank our speaker today. Uh, I truly believe that uh, the continuing education will have more and more place in higher education in the future. But uh, our next speaker is uh, from also from Europe, but he's, uh, he will be talking about uh, traditional uh, higher education target audience students. Uh, he is a founder of Forward College, uh, which is experimental college uh, uh, established in France, uh, together with uh, London School, uh, Lon University of London, which is very interesting, and having presence in uh, also in Germany and Portugal. Uh, it's very interesting attempt to build uh, authentic, at least as founders uh, claim, authentic students experiment. Please join us in two weeks time. Thank you, Frederick, again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And see you in a fortnight.